God shows every one of his saints throughout all of history two things. The destination, where those prayers go, what he does with them, and then the application of those prayers to the events on earth. And God puts those two together. And if we look carefully at the scene in chapter 8 of Revelation, it explains for us one of the greatest mysteries of heaven. We can see how God responds to the prayers of his saints. Prayer is huge in our lives as believers, and it's fitting that here in Revelation, God would give us an all-encompassing teaching about the role, the purpose, and the importance of prayer in our lives. And if that's what we were expecting, we aren't disappointed. Because the Lord does that. Just as Jesus commanded his disciples to pray the disciples' prayer. Now, do you remember that? Our Father who art in heaven. Do you remember when we looked at the stages of that prayer? And Jesus said to his disciples, I command you to follow this route whenever you drive through the pathway of prayer. He commanded. It's one of those imperatives. And he said, this is how you're supposed to start every prayer. Before you even start saying anything, you focus on who you're talking to. The all-knowing, the all-powerful, the everywhere present, all-caring, all-loving God of the universe that never slumbers or sleeps. Surrounded by holiness, he is hallowed, is his name. And he says, once you do that, you say, before I say anything, I want you to rule in my life, and I want whatever your will is to be done. And then I can start sharing my prayer requests. See, that whole setup is what the Lord is emphasizing. And what he says is, I want you to know this. I capture, I get it, I hear it. You know, my kids were showing me something interesting. I always am learning from my children. They're, they're, they're constantly enlightening, Bonnie and I, as old timers. And they were showing us something. They were, with their phones, they were texting. You know, kids text. The average child texts way too much. Uh, they've lost their verbal skills. I mean, they stay up all night, you know, thumbing their phones instead of sleeping. But they showed me something curious. They sent one of their friends a text, and all of a sudden below the text, there's a little balloon and four little dots. I said, what's that? They said, that means that they're looking at it, and they're getting ready to respond. So we watched, and they did this because they knew this person. They knew the person would look at it and not respond and so the four dots came up, and they said, watch. And they left. And there was no reply. And did you know that, as they were showing me that, I thought of countless believers. I mean, a text, you know, goes right to the face of the phone, and they can't miss it. And so they text God. And four little dots come, and God saw the text. And there's silence. See, that's what this chapter is about. What do you do when you text God and he doesn't text you back? What do you do with your text? Well, he says right here, he captures them. This chapter shows how God captures and holds on to every prayer of every saint down through the ages. In chapter 5, verse 8, if you see that, that was two chapters ago, it says he puts them in a bowl. And in chapter 8 right here, and verse 3, that bowl is in front of him all the time. It's in front of the throne of God. He captures those prayers. And the scene around God's throne is, is loud and noisy, but God pauses. And there's silence, and it's not momentary, but it's for approximately the same amount of time that something happens in the Bible. Let, let me take you to something. See, you see why this is so important? Go back with me to Exodus 30. I want to show you something. You know, you can read, and I do read, and I have hundreds, I actually have thousands of books, and I read dozens on this passage. I read what everyone that ever printed anything about, that I have in my 4,500 books that said anything about this chapter. And you know what was fascinating? They all are going on and on, and finally one said, well, if you go back to Exodus 30, you'll figure it out. And so I went back to Exodus 30. Look at Exodus 30 with me, because all of a sudden, if you don't understand Exodus 30, you don't understand what altar is in heaven. I mean, why is there even an altar in heaven? What on earth is God doing with an altar in heaven? I thought altars were in the Old Testament, Right? Isn't that what most people say? I know many people. They don't even need an Old Testament. They just carry around a New Testament because that Old Testament stuff, that's just Old Testament. Well, God is still operating on Old Testament stuff. Did you know that? Because he doesn't change. 
And if it was true and unchangeable, immutable truth, it's still true today, and it's not going to change in the future. And so what he shows us is, way back in Exodus 30, he had this little altar. In fact, I'll show you a little picture of it. Uh, there are a lot of chapters. In fact, there are 25 chapters describing this stuff that's on the screen. It takes two chapters to describe the creation of the entire cosmos and 25 chapters to describe the tent. Now, that means if there's that much of the Bible about it, and if this is what God showed Moses when he took him up in the mountain, he said, I'm going to have you build this little, this little portable worship center, but I want you to build it exactly like it looks up here in heaven. He showed him the heavenly set of objects. And, and Moses brought down engineering plans to build this thing exactly the way God specified. And, and there's so much. I mean, look in verse 7 of chapter 30, uh, this little incense altar. And by the way, the incense altar, if you go from the right on the screen, there's the brazen altar, burnt offering, then there's the laver, and then there's this curtain, this wall. You go into this little room, and it has two chambers. The front chamber on the left has the menorah, the golden candlesticks. On the right-hand side, as you're walking through, it has the showbread, uh, the bread of the face, it's called. And then you bump into what we're looking at this morning, that gold dot up there that is in the, the far left of that first chamber is the golden altar of incense. And look down in verse 7, Aaron shall burn on that thing, God said, sweet incense every morning, and look at verse 8, at night, twilight. And so the day of worship in the tabernacle and temple started with the high priest going there or one of his designates and burning incense, and then that smoke rose while they were doing all the other sacrifices all day long. And then the day closed, verse 8, with the twilight. And so, why? Well, just, I mean, we don't have time to, and we will in the future, but what is going on is the tabernacle incense offerings are telling us something, that God's tabernacle layout brings us directly in front of the throne. Back on that picture, the wall where the, and, and I'll go back and show it to you, that, that wall on the other side of it was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant had this Shekinah glory cloud hovering over the top of it. In fact, when the, when the high priest came in on the Day of Atonement once a year and brought this little vessel of oil, he, I mean of blood, he brought it in and he had to reach under the flame and on top of the box and pour the blood without burning himself from this Shekinah glory cloud of fire that always hovered over that, and that was representative of God's presence. So only once a year could anybody get in by God's presence, but... All day long, that little golden altar had smoke rising, which was a picture of prayer, which takes us, you see, prayer connects us right to the throne. And so what God is trying to say is that prayer is our, our greatest, most powerful way to lift us before the very face of God. Jesus is our intercessor. He opens the door. That's what all those doors in the tabernacle were. The Spirit of God holds and shapes and edits our prayers. That's what Romans 8 is about. Romans 8 says we don't even know what we should pray for like we ought to, but the Spirit fixes our prayers. See, what we do is we say, God, I want this. And the Holy Spirit says, well, actually, God, what he meant was this. That's exactly what Romans 8, 26 says. Aren't you glad that we haven't gotten what we asked for many times, God fixes them. And the way he does it is Jesus opened the way, the Spirit of God brings the prayer and delivers it right before the presence of God. And that's all three members of the Trinity are totally involved. And so prayer connects us to the throne. But when we connect, why is God silent? Well, we're going to read about that, and then we're going to have communion. So, okay. Let's go back to chapter 8. Now it's time to read the text. Now I've drawn enough pictures. Look at chapter 8, and I'm going to read the first six verses, and I want you to see the destination of prayer, and then I want you to see in this instance how God applies an answer to those prayers. It's very graphic, okay? Revelation 8, verse 1 through 6. Let's stand, and we're going to read this, and then we're going to prepare for communion. Revelation 8, verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God. 
And to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Verse 5. Then the angel took the censer filled with the fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. If you caught that, God took all those unanswered prayers that had been building up in that bowl. He had the angels scoop them out. He put them with the incense with coals from the altar. And as they flamed into smoke, I mean, as the flames caused the incense to burst forth into smoke, the angel walks to the edge and he throws it on the earth. And what the Lord is illustrating is He's answering centuries, thousands of years of prayers. And those trumpets, there are seven of them, each one, and we'll see this when we come back, each one are a specific answer to what God's saints have cried for justice, for God to intervene. He does. And what's neat is everyone, everyone gets to see the answers to their prayers because we're all there and we'll all finally connect the dots and we'll see God doing what we ask him to do.